As Canada considers just how to restore and reset the relationship with its First Peoples, Aboriginal leaders are also examining the parameters of what a new era of self-government just might look like. Joining us now to consider one path worth exploring, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Greg Peltzer. He is co-author of From Treaty Peoples to Treaty Nation. He's also executive chair of the International Centre for Northern Governance and Development, University of Saskatchewan. And here in studio, Pam Palmiter, author of Indigenous Nationhood. She's also chair in Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. Pam, it's great to have you back here in our studio. Thanks. And Greg, nice to have you on the program for the first time. I want to start just by uh, reading an excerpt from your book, Greg, and that'll get us into our discussion here. Here we go. The debate about Aboriginal rights in Canada has long been framed in terms of long-established concepts such as colonialism, the nation-state, municipal-like self-government, and provincial status, all of which are bandied about freely. For a decade, Aboriginal intellectuals and political leaders have been enthralled by the language of nationhood. That the federal government is not going to move down this path has not stopped many from demanding national status for Aboriginal peoples. Greg, you wrote those words before the Liberals won the election last October, so I wonder whether you today are standing by the assertion that you don't believe any federal government will move down a path towards this notion of nationhood. I, I think so. And, it's, uh, and there's a very different, and it depends how you de define the term. So if, when we're talking about uh, nationhood in, in one sense, um, if we're talking about as a sovereign state or a sovereign entity, the way we'd look at Germany or France or, or islanded uh, sovereign independent nations within Canada, I don't think that's on the table. And, it, and there is some uh, leaders that uh, the rhetoric moves us in that direction. If we're talking about a nation-to-nation a nation relationship in terms of recognizing and, and respecting that First Nations, uh, Inuit people, Métis people, in this country are distinctive uh, political communities with their own histories, cultures, and, and dynamics that ought to have uh, high degrees of self-determination. I, I think that's uh, totally possible. In fact, that's where Canada is, has been moving for the last uh, 40 years, and we need to continue to move in that direction. Okay, let me follow up with Pam on that. Do you think the election of the Liberals last October changes the dynamic at all in what you're looking for? Oh. I think it totally does. They're clearly using the terminology in a very direct way. It's nation to nation. And this isn't something new. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal People said the way forward is nationhood. We have the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that say it's not some degree of independence. It's not about culture and history. This is self-determination, laws, governments, lands, uh, power, wealth, all of that stuff. And then you have probably the most significant for the Canadian population in terms of a shift the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which clearly says in Recommendation 45, there cannot be any reconciliation going forward between Canada and First Nations until the nation-to-nation -nation relationship is recognized and implemented. Greg is not interpreting nation-to-nation, -nation, though, in the same way you have, right? No, and but but that also ignores the, the legal realities. Treaties can't be signed with citizens or interest groups or uh, community organizations. Treaties, international treaties are signed only with other nations. That was clearly recognized at the time. It's not rhetoric of, of today. This is something that has been consistent and First Nations have been very consistent since contact that we are sovereign independent nations, that we have our own laws and governments and we don't want anything different than what we had then, what we agreed to and what everyone, even the international community seems to recognize going forward. Greg, are you undervaluing the concept of nation to nation? No, I, I don't think so. And, and I look at it, uh, I guess, through the, the experiences uh, I've been engaged in, and, and Ken, my co-author over the last 25 years, and there's a, there's a degree of, I understand where uh, uh, Pamela's coming from in terms of uh, particularly aspirational, and sometimes you need to push the aspirational uh, beyond where we are uh, currently to get to where we need to be. But, but I think about uh, this way, there's lots of countries that are actually multinational, and some of them, in fact, uh, accommodate those realities through some kind of federalization uh, or through a federal system. And you, you can look in Europe, whether it's a Belgium where you have Walloon uh, people, Flemish people, and you have a federal type system that accommodates uh, the very distinctive political communities, uh, some would argue as nations within there.
And I think that's all uh, completely possible within Canada. And this is where I look at, if we're looking at uh, First Nations as uh, political communities in and of their own right, yes, fully agree with that. In fact, uh, we argue for that in terms of self-government uh, within Canada in that uh, agreements like the NISCA agreement, as an example, was, which was uh, a milestone in Canada, actually extends the notion of federalism to recognize third orders of government. So I think those kind of things where we're sharing sovereignty uh, among political entities in Canada is part of the Canadian political experiment. And so I think that's uh, completely within the realm of reality. Quite frankly, we need to go there. Okay, um, let me follow up with Pam on this angle then. Uh, as far as I understand it, most Indigenous people in this country live off reserve, not on reserve, right? Actually, every Indigenous person in this country lives on their traditional territories or the traditional territory well, of someone point. else. Keep in mind, reserves have only been around a couple hundred years at most. Okay, that's a fun, right? You always learn something new during this program, <laughs> Pam. Thank you. That's a very good point because I, I wanted to ask whether or not the urban nature of, of where most Indigenous Canadians live means that your version of nationhood almost by definition can't happen. No, and, and in fact, the, the fact that we are no longer defining or limiting ourselves to our reserve uh, communities and really thinking about what is nationhood, our jurisdiction extends on or off artificially created reserves. It extends on or off artificially created uh, provincial borders and in fact expands and strengthens our jurisdiction like it would with any other nation. Okay, let's go back to Greg's book here. Greg, I'm going to do another excerpt. Here we go. Aboriginal peoples require a new political structure that fits within Canada's existing constitutional and political framework. Such a structure would have to recognize Aboriginal rights to self-government and would have to be able to function effectively. It would have to be fiscally realistic and accountable, and it would have to be democratic. We recommend creating a commonwealth of Aboriginal peoples. Okay, Greg, how did you get there? So a couple of things. One of the things I, I think is unrealistic is that we're going to open up the Canadian Constitution uh, per se in federal and provincial politicians. You look at even uh, the Quebec uh, question within Canada. Whether we ought to or not is one question. Uh, whether it's pragmatic to do in the foreseeable future is another. And I think we also need to recognize however the political accommodation occurs within Canada, it's going to occur within a Canadian uh, framework, even if we do change the, uh, were to change the Constitution. So I, the idea that there'll be separate independent nations uh, and that there, in the same way that there would be relations between Canada and the United States or Canada and First Nations, I don't think is realistically on the table. Having said that, where can we push the borders and push the boundaries within Canada? And in our view, we think that where to take the federal, currently the federal responsibility in Section 91, uh, for a fiduciary responsibility to Aboriginal peoples in Canada, is really managed by, through the Department of uh, Indigenous Northern Affairs, and we think those days should be gone, that we're, we're past those days. It should be, in our view, uh, recognizing uh, Indigenous self-determination that it should be ind Indigenous electorate within Canada that are electing the officials that are managing uh, the programs, directions, and so on. Okay, let me just stop and not you there. Some minister in let Canada. Me, yeah, lots yeah. to chew on here already. So let me just uh, let me get your take so far on this notion of a commonwealth of Aboriginal peoples. Well, first of all, it's nothing new and innovative. Uh, there have been non-Indigenous peoples advocating that we're all just one big group of people. Wouldn't it be easier if we just had one interest group organization and we only have to deal with one First Nation person at a time and really, you know, reduce our hassle? And if and if you look at the Commonwealth, you know, proposal, they're saying this big commonwealth organization which would have absolute authority and autonomy and freedom uh, even over these First Nations would really mean that First Nation leaders can be can stay in their communities. So you really reduce the relationship instead of expound upon it. But if you look at the core characteristics, it really reads like a list of right-wing gripes all dealt with in one big bundle. They'll have to pay taxes. They're going to be accountable because the implication is that they're not accountable. They're going to be an interest group. They'll have no land. They'll have no sovereignty. And all those court cases, well, they're just getting in the way of, of uh, us moving forward. And it 
completely ignores all legal political reality and our entire history of working together. It's, it's one big Aboriginal organization, and we can see with all the problems with the AFN, the last thing we want is an, a big, all-encompassing Aboriginal organization that has complete and unfettered discretion, except to report to Parliament, no, not to the Indigenous peoples, but to Parliament. So this is a non-starter as far uh, as you're concerned? Non-starter and nothing new. We've heard it all before. Greg, your reaction? I guess that uh, we don't see, obviously, the characterization that, that Pam has of, of the concept of the Commonwealth. In fact, we see it very much as a step away uh, or, or a step toward decolonizing the relationship. And we see uh, one of the interesting things, uh, myself for the last 25 years, and, and Ken as, as well for a large degree, um, uh, almost all the students I've taught, frankly, over the 25 years, have been uh, First Nation, Métis, and Northern students. I've actually taught uh, over my career very few uh, non-Aboriginal and uh, uh, non-Northern students. And one of the things that was interesting, when we tested out in the draft chapters, this is something we've been working on over 20 years. Uh, the students in, in our classes, over the years, in, in number of them are uh, First Nations leaders in their own right, uh, in different uh, programs we've had over the years, testing it out. And it's actually resonated extremely well. It's one of the things that our, our students, whether from Ontario to uh, uh, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, and frankly, even uh, internationally when we've tested out with uh, Sami students and so on from Indigenous peoples in, in Norway, we actually got a very positive response. And the, and the reason why we got a, a positive response and putting it forward is one is that there's a, rather than having a bureaucracy that's overwhelmingly non-Aboriginal making decisions on the lives and programming of indigenous peoples, it's, it's a, a mechanism, uh, institutional mechanism for empowerment. The other thing is that in terms of accountability, first and foremost, it's to an indigenous electorate. It's a, the electorate that chooses, uh, in our conception, we throw out uh, their own leadership, would be staffed by Indigenous people uh, across the country. Okay, I'm going to jump first in again, and foremost, Greg, the accountability I, I, goes to Indigenous communities. I think we get all that. I think you've made that point, but I, I, I do want to have a better understanding of how the funding of a Commonwealth of Aboriginal peoples, how you sure. would see that working. Yeah, and, and here's, and I, I think Pamela is quite right when she uh, points on uh, uh, an issue that you see, I see it right across Canada, and I think a very unfair uh, characterization of. Uh, uh, the fiscal arrangements within Canada in relation to Indigenous peoples, that somehow it's a taxpayer's burden, that Indigenous peoples are getting a, a free ride, in, in it, and it's a total mischaracterization uh, of the reality in Canada, in, and fundamentally cuts against the, our notion, at least we think our notions, of what's fair and just in, in this country. And one of the things that First Nations leaders across Canada have, and Métis leaders as well, Inuit, have uh, constantly argued is a fair share of the wealth that derives from the country. And uh, First Nations people wrote, uh, they developed treaties, when you go back, and I agree with Pamela on this, in terms of partnerships of between political communities, and there was a notion around that in terms of sharing the wealth of the country. That really hasn't happened in any kind of uh, real way I in Canada. And so what we're arguing is that if we took a percentage of the GDP, there's different mechanisms you could measure that, but say, uh, even if it was on a proportional basis, even if it was that, but it was a fair share for First Nations to make decisions over the enormous wealth that comes off this land, then it's not, it's, it's a sharing of wealth. It's, okay, and let me it's get some feedback on principle. that. Let me get some yeah. feedback. Pam, does that work the for you? The proposal is population-based, 4%, which means you don't have to pay a dime more. That's what the proposal's saying. So it's not talking about a fair share of the lands and resources and wealth that come from different traditional territories for different uh, indigenous nations. We're talking about some convoluted idea of making sure that the money stays the same, that, that we don't really engage in reconciliation, that there is no recognition that the land is ours. Whether there's 10 of us or 2 million of us, the land is ours and an ownership recognition, especially where there's 
and there's vast quantities of unceded territory. Um, that's, that's all the land, and not just natural resources. It's very limited thinking to think about that. Think about all the taxes, fees, licenses, and all of the wealth that goes on our highways. All of those things um, are, haven't been shared with First Nations despite treaties or despite areas that don't have treaties. So it's not taking into account you know, our traditional territories, but even worse, we're lumping in Inuit who already have their own governance structures and land claims and fiscal scenarios with Métis who've been around for a couple hundred years and have very different set of rights uh, with First Nations who have been here since time immemorial and are the original owners of, of their traditional territories. You simply can't lump them all into one group and say, oh yeah, and we're going to add everyone who's a non-status Indian, but no more money. I mean, it, this proposal will actually mean less money and it'll benefit this, this large bureaucracy, which is really just INAC described in a different way because its primary goal is programs and services. INAC? Indian, in Indian and Northern, Northern Affairs, Affairs Canada, Canada, which is still their legal name. Okay. So what do you suggest? <laughs> well, I suggest that the Truth and Reconciliation and the Royal Commission and the Prime Minister and First Nations have consistently advocated for, that we need to have our sovereignty and jurisdiction recognized. That doesn't mean the kind of Quebec sovereignty where we, you know, get up and go somewhere. We're talking about the recognition of jurisdiction, our right to be self-determining, and we'll decide for ourselves what laws and governing structures and relationships that we want to have, what businesses we want to get into, and then that that's the kind of self-sufficiency where we don't need to be going back to Parliament saying, you know, give me this, give me that from my own bank. It'll be, this is our bank, we'll spend it and make all the same mistakes as any other government in this country does and we'll move forward in a much better way. Greg, I'm down to my last 30 seconds, but how does that sound to you? Well, actually, a lot of what Pamela just said, we actually wrote in the book. So I, I have to agree with her. So it's, I'd right, be going against the own words we've written in our own book. So, uh, yeah, it, no, it's, yeah, you take the point, uh, we don't limit it simply to the natural uh, resource uh, wealth. We're actually very clear about that in the book. In, and the other thing I, I think Pamela, I fully agree with, in terms of uh, indigenous structures of governance, it makes most sense if the communities themselves are deciding what's appropriate for governance uh, for their own communities. And we've seen multiple uh, examples quite successful in Canada, and there's no reason why we can't continue to move in that direction. I think I'm going to grab that moment of consensus and run with it. <laughs> so Greg Peltzer and Pam Palmiter, thanks for joining us on TVO tonight for most interesting discussion. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.